It is now 1810 hours, homeward bound, heading east-northeast, depth about 200 feet. Just short of 200 feet and so now. Condensation seems somewhat less than normal. CO2 less than 0.5%. Oxygen, 100 pounds. Well, okay, take her up now. Very well. Back to the hangar. The diving saucer returns from a world where the sun never shines. Our pocket submarine is shaped like a disc to avoid snags. Water jets that swivel take the place of propeller and rudder. The diving saucer heads for her garage. This is the first time an undersea boat has ever had an undersea base. There are no storms here. The hangar door is a placid pool. We have eliminated wind and waves that imperil the saucer on operations to and from the surface of the ocean. Inside the submarine hangar, 35 feet down, is a four-ton winch to hoist the saucer into the dry. This steel shell holds down a big bubble of compressed air like a cup turned upside down and pushed into a bowl of water. The diving saucer, piloted by Albert Falco, has made more than a hundred scientific voyages down to a thousand feet. She gives two men up to 24 hours of oxygen and four hours of electric power. Most of her machinery is outside the hull, streamlined by plastic fenders. After each dive, Technicians check the little boat. They recharge batteries, reload cameras, test the mercury ballast, refill oxygen bottles, and provide fresh soda lime 
to remove carbon dioxide from the air inside. But they are waiting dinner for us at headquarters. Let's get going before night falls. This is headquarters of Continental Shelf Station number two, or Conshelf two. It is a cozy five-room lodge, the big house of our village on the sea floor. These men are the first oceanotes. They are going to live down here for a month. The ocean oats are subjected to double normal pressure without feeling it. They receive a generous flow of pure air, but compared with surface air, it is twice as heavy, contains twice the oxygen, and makes tobacco burn twice as fast. These sunken houses permit us to escape many limitations of diving. The ocean oats may work 80 feet down the reef five hours a day, or make excursions 165 feet deep and return directly to base. They no longer risk decompression accidents, the bends, which would strike them if they had to go back to the surface. Men of quite different walks of life, a biology professor, a cook, a physical education instructor, a customs inspector, an industrial draftsman, are the pioneers of an historic adventure, conquest of the continental shelf, a worldwide territory larger than Africa. Conshelf too is situated in the open sea. It stands along a table reef across which white breakers foam. Our topside crew crosses the reef on a bridge from our floating base, Rosaldo, she supplies air and electricity to the station, while Calypso looks after our security. Our headquarters and the saucer hangar are on this ledge, 35 feet beneath the surface. 86 feet down is our deep cabin. Still further down the reef, we placed anti-shark cages. The ocean oats living in the upper station can visit their friends 50 feet below, but those in the deep cabin must not come up for fear of fatal bends. Heavy smoker Raymond Kienzi has volunteered to spend a week in the deep cabin. Down there, he will have to give up his pipe. It would contaminate the recirculated atmosphere. For myself, I belong to Calypso. Now I will have to go up and hang around for an hour in a decompression stop 10 feet under the keel of my ship. Free from such misery, the ocean oats took over the explorations and discoveries of the day.
Through a liquid door, ocean notes pass with equal ease from air to water or from water to air. In the morning, cook Pierrot Gilbert calls the surface to discuss his menu with Simon Cousteau. They try to do their best with the ship's provisions. Life six fathoms under the sea becomes almost uneventful. But this is a big day. Two men in black masks are leaving to settle in the deep cabin for a week. Raymond Kienzi and André Portulatin are moving man's homestead further into the sea. If they succeed, it will become possible to systematically exploit the resources of the ocean. Professor Vessier escorts them to their new dwelling, ready to help in case of emergency. Piero, the cook, also volunteered to live in the deep cabin, but must be content to watch them depart. Headquarters converses with the black masks by ultrasound wireless telephone. They wear transmitters on their legs and earphones and microphones in their masks. We keep constant vigil over the deep men. The deep cabin is filled with a mixture of helium, nitrogen, and oxygen at a pressure of three and a half atmospheres. The lower deck is a wet room where the black masks store diving gear and take showers. Up the ladder, is their tiny cell in which they will eat and sleep for seven days. They are not quite alone. A television eye reports their situation to headquarters day and night. And the helium they have begun to breathe gives them quite a surprise. Allô, petite maison? Allô, petite maison? Nous sommes bien arrivés. Jusqu'ici, tout va bien. <rire> Ça va? Ça va. Ça va? Ça va? <rire> It required two ships, 20 sailors and 25 divers to establish Conshelf 2. Bundles of pipes and cables run from the support ship to the station. The buildings are held down by 200 tons of lead. The silver oceanauts are helped by Calypso divers dressed in black to service the submerged hamlet. Seaweed grows so quickly on the buildings they must be scrubbed each morning. The bustle has carried away sharks Leaving only one villain, Jules, 
a six foot barracuda. The oceanauts take turns sunbathing inside the sea. Each man needs 10 minutes a day of ultraviolet rays for his health. It also improves André's morale. Calypso divers are eager to make life pleasant for the oceanauts. Antonio Lopez offers his skill as a hair cutter. André subconsciously clings to terrestrial tastes. The other inhabitants of the sea are a bit disturbed by visitors from topside. The first oceanauts have crossed to a new way of life. Their sense of time becomes hazy. They neglect the clock and the calendar. They shut off the radio and select their own tape recordings. Conshelf 2 is upside down in lots of other ways. We live with fish, but we open a can of sardines. The air, thick as syrup, slows the ventilators to half speed. In the deep cabin, he-men sound like schoolgirls. Cuts and abrasions heal overnight. Beards almost stop growing. People like to stand on their heads. We can't remember whether we are outside the aquarium or inside. And, of course, we feed the fish with rabbit meat. Every day, we send up 40 empty four-bottle aqualungs to be refilled with compressed air. Calypso divers bring all our supplies down in pressure cookers. The oceanauts would like to forget all these fussy people on top, but must rely heavily on them. Undersea stations of the future will be independent. Calypso's doctor has balanced the diet of Conchelf II. He finds that when men breathe double oxygen, there is a reduction in the number of red corpuscles in their blood. After a few days, the count becomes stabilized. It is just the opposite of what happens to mountaineers. Claude Wesley welcomes our parrot and introduces him to some parrot fish.
birds are more sensitive than men to their environment. If this part can stand the pressure, it will encourage the men. The deep cabin is sunk in brooding calm. Sun and shadow have lost their meaning. Light comes from all directions. The men living down here breathe a gas mixture designed to reduce pressure effects on human beings. They themselves control the proportions of helium, oxygen, and nitrogen. Every other day, they use 110 pounds of chemicals to absorb carbon dioxide from their respiration. Calypso divers bring them fresh supplies and scatter the harmless waste in the sea. In the coral jungle, the oceanotes capture all sorts of fish alive and unharmed. They use traditional gear, gill nets, landing nets and traps, and set them with a precision that a man would never achieve from a boat.
to better understand the living history of our reef, the men take coral samples from various levels. In spite of certain troublemakers, who are not frightened by the sound of hammers. Divers check the net several times a day and remove captive fish before they drown. These prisoners are sentenced for life in the aquarium at Monaco. Calypso divers will collect the bags and ship them there by plane. We did not foresee that big fish would regard this as a free lunch counter. Unable to comprehend what interferes with feeding, they go crazy with frustration.
By night and by day, as soon as her batteries are recharged, the diving saucer departs on missions. Before plunging into the unknown, the submarine glides across the station, which is lighted like an airport. At night, plankton rises from the deeps. It sinks back at the first glimmer of light, as if scared of the sun. In harmony with the rhythm of days, these vertical migrations set in motion millions of tons of living matter. Oceanauts can study the tiny creatures of the plankton without removing them from the sea. A motorized diver holds a plankton net through layers of minute beings. Very fragile organisms can be filmed intact in a small transparent box that fits into a special camera. All forms of life evolve from the sea, and there we find the greatest variety of species. Some are nothing but organized water. A small crustacean hides in a delicate crystal home. A jelly cup pumps like a heart. In the pulsing ocean, little barrels made of light, translucent insects, shivering globes, Silver larvae feed, multiply, and die. At night, the deep cabin seems like a house of exile. With foreboding hearts, the deep men look for sleep. 
When their stay is over, they will have to breathe from these masks for hours before they can go up. Meanwhile, their lives depend on machinery. Everybody is asleep on Rosaldo. The fish are in bed. Kenzie and Port Latin have finally gone to sleep. Diving now for 20 years. Yet, when I am alone in the sea at night, I am still afraid. It is in the night that you meet the strangest creatures. Their shapes, their colors, their movements are stolen from nightmares. A sea snail with gills like plumes. The sea devil flies with curling wings. I found myself alone, staring with fright at a bush that walks. This tangle of roots and branches is a single animal. Sleeping monster I found in a grotto at night. We call it the bump fish. In daylight, you are lucky if you can even glimpse a bump fish at a distance. At night, I can stroke them. Every time I come across a fish new to me, I am scared at first. Then, I observe his reflexes and, little by little, gain his confidence. Thank you. 
At dawn, the bonefish emerge from their caves and move off in a herd like bison. They live on coral. They butt their heads against it, break off a piece, and grind it with their jaws. A 90-pounder joins the migration to browse in stone pastures. A team of oceanauts swims out to collect biological samples. To a naturalist, the valley is like a catalogue of tropical sea life. Collectors must be able to spot the tiniest and best camouflaged animals, to distinguish rare or unknown ones, and to patiently observe their behavior. Oceanauts have lots more time than divers to spend in the field. We bring specimens back to our lab. Professor Vessier files them away or exploits them immediately. This is the first time a marine biological laboratory is installed on the sea bottom. Here we can make experiments that are not possible on shore. For example, in microbiology, 
Up there, specimens die or are contaminated during transportation, while down here, we study them without delay. The laboratory in Conshelf 2 is the forerunner of a network of permanent undersea observatories in the world ocean. They will be open to investigators of all nations. From the deep cabin, the black masks strike down to 165 feet to work almost without time limit, or they penetrate for a few minutes to more than 300 feet. From their loneliness, these descents are a liberation. Strung down the slope are anti-shark cages, the blockhouses of our frontier. They are connected to headquarters by alarm buzzers and blinker signals. The black masks go on an inspection tour to see that the cage alarms are working. They have just turned on the reserve 
which means that three out of their four bottles are empty. From cage number four, they signal headquarters to send fresh aqualangs to cage number five. On their way back, the oceanodes pass not one, but hundreds of barracudas. In higher territory, the oceanotes set up a TV camera which scouts for a remote-controlled movie camera. The system allows us to observe and make movies of animals bothered by the presence of men. Andre watches the television monitor. When something interesting takes place, he triggers the movie camera. That is how we spied on a lazy fish that lived with two small crustaceans. He leaves the housekeeping entirely up to them. The little fellow thinks he's a bulldozer. He even knows how to wedge a big stone with a smaller one. Headquarters gets ready for the return of the men in the black masks after seven days below.
Their bodies are saturated with gases, breathed under pressure. To ascend safely, they must inhale a special mixture for three hours. It is a critical test of their whole ordeal. The monitor watches them closely until the last moment. Before they went down, our calculations and laboratory tests indicated that the project was safe. But now, for the first time, living men are trying the theory in the real sea. The black masks rise above their roof and climb cautiously toward headquarters. The deep men have come back safe and sound. We can now move with confidence to plant bases further down in the sea. The occupation of the continental shelf has begun. Kensi and Portilatin have returned from the future. Every night, an expedition goes out with narrow beam searchlights. Parrot fish sleep in the shelter 
a fire coral. To avoid severe burns from the fire coral, they are covered from head to foot. The sleepers awake in dazzling light. They are transfixed like rabbits blinded by the headlights of a car. The fish that we have caught with searchlights are held in plastic paneled stockades. Starfish, despite their peaceful appearance, are carnivores specially adapted to eat shellfish. Scallops have many eyes to look out for their dreaded enemy.
scallops travel by jet like a diving saucer. How about a test of the hydraulic claw? Okay. This afternoon, the 29th of June, 1730 hours, dive 114, exploration of the northwest sector of station to depth of 1,000 feet. The depth is minus 330 feet. 
a jagged bed of dead coal sprinkled with white sand. There is not much life here. Minus 360 feet. We are gliding over a sort of cracked sidewalk that hangs over a precipice. Let her sink along the cliff. Minus 500 feet. Minus 650 feet. Minus 800 feet. Big scarlet fish mark the end of the vertical desert. At this point, 820 feet down, we enter another zone of life where everything is to be discovered.
minus 850 feet. Every inch of rock here is encrusted with oyster shells. Fossil oysters at this depth prove that sea level has changed considerably over the ages. Minus 1,000 feet. We are flying over the Sahara. There are even gazelles. All that's missing is an oasis with palm trees. Hundreds, thousands of crabs at a thousand feet. A mass meeting of crabs. It must be their mating season. They cover the bottom for miles.
a monster, a shark of the great deeps. It is blinded by our lights. It must be more than 20 feet long. It probably weighs 3,000 pounds. Nineteen fifty hours. Depth minus nine hundred and twenty feet. We're going up. It's 20 hours. It will be dark up there. Yes. What do we do now? You think we should explore the tunnel? Why not? At the end of the tunnel, a miniature lake. A pocket of air and vapor a cave in which light shines for the first time. Thank <laughs> you. 
We have lived in the bosom of the sea. The sea has indulged us, but we have taken only the first steps into our new space. Further adventures await oceanauts in the world without sun.